Hello, everybody, and welcome to Virtual Trek Con with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. How are you? We're also joined by Aaron McDonald, Mary Chifo, Mohammed Noor, and Aliza Pearl. How's everybody doing? Hey. Great. Two thumbs up. Okay. Yes, Maj, as we would say in Klingon. Nice. <laughs> Sirach, I cut you off. How are you, by the way? I'm doing good. I'm awesome. doing all right. Great. Yeah. Um, so this panel is a fan to pro panel where we talk about people that have been lifelong Star Trek fans and it has either influenced, guided, or been a major part of their work and their lives and their careers. Uh, would you like to tell us about yourselves a little bit? We'll start with Mr. Mohammed Noor. Sure. Uh, my name is Mohammed Noor. I'm a professor oh. at Duke. I'm a professor at Duke University. Um, I've been a fan. Uh, you want like a really brief intro or do you want like a elaborated thing? <laughs> yeah, let's give it Go 30 it. seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> so Trek wise, I mean, I've been giving talks at conventions for a couple of years now. I've written a book on, on uh, depictions of genetics and evolution in Star Trek. And very recently I was taken on as a, an occasional science consultant for Star Trek episodes for the current series. So that's been very exciting. And I've been incorporating Star Trek into my classes at Duke University. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about you, Aaron McDonald? Um, so I have a PhD in astrophysics. I left academia to get into more teaching and outreach and uh, started doing science consulting for the entertainment industry. So I teach science through popular culture on live streams and uh, at sci-fi conventions. And then just this past year, I was made the science consultant for the Star Trek franchise. So that's my, my full-time job now. Woo -woo. <laughs> okay. Okay. Pretty awesome job too, by the Very way. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Aliza. Hello. Uh, I'm Aliza Pearl. I am an actor, writer, and content creator, and also improviser. And that plays in very closely with my Star Trek work too. Um, I uh, helped uh, co-create, co-produce, and co-direct a stage show called The Improvised Generation, which is a bunch of professional actors and lifelong Trekkies who create improvised stories from scratch uh, with uh, Star Trek, like in the Star Trek universe. We've been doing that for five years now, which is kind of wild to think wow. about. Um, and I also do RPG gaming and a lot of it has been sci-fi and specifically Star Trek focused. So right now I'm co-producing and also a part of the cast of an all Klingon Star Trek Adventures game from Modiphius who are um, the official creators of Star Trek Adventures tabletop RPG system. Awesome. Wow. Uh, Miss Mary Chifo, I'm not really sure if you need to introduce yourself. I think we kind of know who you are, but go ahead anyway, I guess. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I'm just like beaming looking at all these incredible humans. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love I love what Star Trek um, does and brings to the world. Um, so yes, I, I am Mary Chifo. I play I'm Gonna Bust It Out. Laurel. Nice. <laughs> yeah, bust it Love out. it. I mean, yes. I was saying I got this at a, a Starbase Indie last year from the Klingon Language Institute. They had this as part of their photo booth and let me keep it. Um, so another yeah. testament to the beauty of the community that we have. Um, but yes, I play Chancellor Laurel on Star Trek Discovery in seasons one and two. And that's how you say it in Kling Dish. They have a little bit more of a sh with the s sounds, mm. which is one of my oh, favorite things to throw. It's dish cover it. <laughs> you know, actually, Discovery. something I heard about the Klingon language, and maybe you can dispel this myth or confirm it. I heard a <laughs> long time ago that they don't have an e sound; they just have an i sound. So it's not Klingon; it's like Klingon. Is that right? Yeah. Klingon. There's yeah, yeah. The um, they only have one sound per vowel. Um, in the, I don't think I have the dictionary. I wish I had that. I could just buzz. I had all my Klingon stuff just roll out. I do have the, um, the Klingon way with me. Um, nice. but yes, I, um, they have, um, yeah, for every vowel, there's just one particular sound, um, which was part of when I developed my, uh, English speaking dialect with Rhea Nolan, our dialect coach. Um, I basically created a dialogue, a dialect sheet, like I would, if I were doing an Irish accent, but based off of the sounds that are in the Klingon dictionary. So that particularly Laurel's story of being completely in the Klingon culture up until that point, while she was fluent in English, she still had the, the, um, reverberations of the sounds that, um, Klingon, her Klingon language, right. um, 
created. So yeah, there, yeah, it's, it's, it's really fun. And I, yes, yeah, I highly recommend looking at the Klingon dictionary. Um, Sounds it's just confusing. It's, Kalesh. it's, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Kalesh, as Shazad would say, <laughs> Kalesh. <laughs> it's a very particular way. But yes, but that's, but that's me. And, and I, I think out of everyone here probably came into Star Trek as a, a fan, um, late i was i'm the latest to the game but then went full throttle i had loved uh the franchise before i was cast but it wasn't until i was cast that i really did the deep dive into all of the different series with mm. obviously a klingon focus um but since then i've just fallen in love with all the shows particularly deep space nine nice yeah. <laughs> that was the follow-up question right there yeah yeah nice. um it's true, and I was just watching the episode where, um, oh, I was watching some Groka episodes, um, but then the follow-up where, where Jake goes down and witnesses war with, with the journaling, and it's oh, yeah. such an impactful episode, so moving, um, and your performance is so beautiful. So I oh, wanted to geek you. out a little bit. <laughs> um, but that's, yeah, it's been such a gift that uh, Trek has become more and more a part of my life as I've gotten older. <laughs> mm. Sirak, you remember the uh, we just uh, did the first Grilka episode with the uh, House of Quark when Quark gets yes. married. Yes, I love that episode. So yes. good, it's Hilarious. so good. And yeah, um, yeah, Mary Mary Kay, what is it? Mary, why I always forget her last name. Who plays Grilka? Just does such a great Mary Kay Adams. There we go. Um, mm -hmm. Great job. She's like my favorite female Klingon. Like every time, she just like owns the sexiness and the power. <laughs> Wonderful. Nice. She does. She does, and she's the first person that left uh, Quark's like speechless. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he's used to being the alpha male, right? And he mm -hmm. he finally found somebody more alpha than him. He yeah. Sunned. So fun. Yeah. So fun. <clears throat> I love so it. I did want to kind of go around and and talk about everybody's fandom at first. Like uh, Mary, you already kind of opened that up for us a bit. Um, what was the first Star Trek series you watched, uh, Mary? Um, for me, I, my first intro was actually the 2009 reboot film. That was, I had been aware of Trek before then. Um, and I'm a huge sci-fi fantasy fan in general, but it was not the thing I grew up with, um, as much as other, um, other franchises. Um, and then I got totally hooked because I was just like, the, the chemistry of the cast and the stories in space. Blah, blah, blah. And then my dad, uh, was like, okay, well, let's watch the original, um, mainly the films uh, with the original cast and then of course watched some you know episodes here and there of TOS um and was a, again had seen perhaps on TV some of the uh TNG uh episodes was aware um but it truly wasn't until I was doing the Klingon centric and then I watched in chronological order um from Enterprise onward uh every Klingon centric episode so that was my intro wow. to all yeah I'm an overachiever and I'm proud of it. <laughs> but it was great. I mean, it was extremely informative and particularly in Deep Space Nine, there's so many wonderful Klingon episodes um, that really go into the history and lore. And uh, I got totally sucked in and um, just fell in love with all the characters outside of the Klingon ones. And mm -hmm. actually did just watch most of Deep Space Nine because I got so sucked into the plot. By the end, I was it like, it happens. Okay, I watch the whole thing. <laughs> but yeah, that's my, that's my general origin story with all got that. It. That's amazing. Just really just sucked in all of the Klingon knowledge. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. <laughs> retained as much as I could. Mm. Elisa, what about you? Uh, next Generation? Yes. Well, it's it kind of, I'm not sure exactly which was first, but TNG and TOS were definitely the first that, you know, that I saw as a child. And um, TOS was like late night reruns mostly. And then... TNG I remember watching that as a kid at my aunt and uncle's house and they we would spend the summers with them in Miami and they were very crunchy hippie vegan and they were like no media no TV sounds shows. like my people right there yeah <laughs> <laughs> except the only thing we were allowed to watch in their house was Star Trek like, oh so cool. we would just like watch Star Trek in their house and and eat soy dogs and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my Saturday night, right? <laughs> oh, you would have, you would have loved it. You would you should meet my aunt and uncle. They they love you. Um but yeah that was that was my introduction to to Star Trek as a kid. And 
Um, and I think my dad was also super into Voyager when that came out. I didn't watch that very much with him, um, but I think he had a crush on Seven of Nine. <laughs> um, that's why he likes it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, uh, so yeah, my, and my story is not also, it's also not like a, a very linear fandom story because as a kid, I was into Star Trek and I was into sci-fi and opera and all these, I just had like lots of big ideas and stuff. And then when I became an actor professionally after college, um, I kind of like retreated into following what I thought I should do as an actor, like being, you know, just like uh, learning what I needed to learn and go being in classes and stuff. And I kind of lost kind of my own sense of who I was and my interests. And so after several years of this and feeling kind of like I was spinning my wheels in my acting career, I just was like, well, what do I like? What what do I want to like spend my brain energy on right now to make me feel good? And I was like, well, I've always loved space and sci-fi. And I decided to just start going to like events with community people who are like into NASA, like NASA events, JPL, since I'm in Southern California, it's like right, you know, in our backyard. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I started going to Star Trek fan events and I started watching Star Trek chronologically um, as much as possible chronologically. And that's when I got rehooked on Star Trek and my creativity also got unlocked. I started writing again. I started um, really realizing what types of characters I want to play as an actor and like what's really in my wheelhouse. What can I stretch to become? And um, Star Trek just like completely got me back on track creatively and professionally. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Star Trek yeah. like inspires so many people. And there's, there's so many stories of people that say, I want to become a writer because of Star Trek. I want to become a, let me guess, Mohammed and Aaron, a scientist because of <laughs> Star Trek, you know? Uh, what about you, Mohammed? How did you get your start in uh, Star Trek fandom? So I've got a lot of gray in my beard. So I started a little earlier. <laughs> Back in the late 70s, I was watching uh, repeats of Star Trek. I, I, was, I wasn't alive when it was when it originally aired, but I was mm -hmm. watching the original series then in repeats in the 70s. And I remember even like the, when the premiere for Next Generation came on, I remember being all ready and like got my parents in the room like, we're going to watch this. I can't wait. There's going to be more Star Trek. <laughs> I was very into it right off the bat. Um, and then basically all the other series, I've just been following them as they came out. I've just been watching them as mm -hmm. they came out and been very excited for each one. Now, when I was working on, uh, on my book, um, I actually did a deep dive and went through all 700 some episodes in like a one year period. <laughs> that wow. was intense, wow. but I wanted to make wow. sure I didn't miss anything as I was going through the book. And, you know, I, I thought about just doing like searches and things like that through the scripts, but the problem is sometimes the right word isn't used in, in terms of the mm -hmm. science concepts. Mm. So I actually just went through either the script or the episode for every single one then. So that was, mm. that was intense. I need to take a short break after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A short break? <laughs> <laughs> short break. <laughs> wow, that's, that that's is amazing. intense. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of TV. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron McDonald, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of came into it a little bit later, too. Kind of like what Mary was saying, that I I loved sci-fi. I loved action, but I didn't grow up with Star Trek. My family wasn't, you know, I didn't really have that around. Um, but when I went to college, when I was doing my undergrad, I was studying physics and mathematics. And I've joked about this before, but in the Venn diagram of Star Trek fans and physicists, there's like a big overlap. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and literally like the physics parties were, have always had TNG on in the background and it would always just devolve into like drinking games of, you know, <laughs> Picard adjusting his shirt yeah. and making yeah. nice. a and have drink. <laughs> that was, those were like my first introductions. But then um, actually the night we all graduated with our undergrad degrees um, was the same night that the 2009 film premiered. And so we literally like went from our graduation <laughs> like did our obligatory dinners with family and stuff and then all changed <laughs> into Star Trek uniforms and went to the midnight premiere and that was my first exposure to like in-person fandom because I'd uh -huh. always I'd always you know been a fan of various franchises and things growing up but uh, that was the first time where it was I'd never been to really a convention or anything like that and it was just like 
oh, this is my scene. (laughs) (laughs) And um, only a couple weeks later, I actually moved to Scotland to do my PhD. So it was like, I graduated, had this incredible experience, went and got a tattoo, like, (laughs) you know, totally (laughs) responsible. And then moved to Scotland and I didn't know anyone there. And I was just like, well, now that I'm like writing this Star Trek high, let's just go and watch everything. And being sort of off in a new country without knowing anyone as a woman pursuing this, you know, hard science PhD, I really got attached to Captain Janeway and Voyager. And Mm -hmm. that kind of kept me going through those darker days of my PhD. Um, But then that, you know, that drove me to meet more people. And I I ended up meeting a lot of friends and colleagues in graduate school because of Star Trek, because I wouldn't shut up about it. And then (laughs) I would never other Star Trek fans. (laughs) And uh, yeah, really, it's meant a lot to me over the years. And, you you mm-hmm. dedicated your dissertation to her, right? I did, yeah. I wrote wow. in my thesis at the end of like my acknowledgments, I said, you know, finally to Captain Janeway, like I'll never be able to explain how much she got me through the darkest days of my PhD. And I did get to meet Kate Mulgrew and uh, kind of, I didn't like ambush her, but I kind of ambushed her. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of did. <laughs> ah, gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's, you know, signing all these things. I I was literally a guest at a convention like six years later when I started doing this professionally, and um, and she was a guest as well. And I just stood in line between my panels and <laughs> had my thesis and said, you know, here's my PhD dissertation, which is that thick, and can do you mind signing my acknowledgement? And she was kind of like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> that's, that's a thing. <laughs> But she, I mean, but she was fabulous. And Mm -hmm. and yeah, I think Mary and I were kind of talking a little bit too about how we've all met each other through Star Trek, through our love of Star Mm -hmm. Trek. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. Or, uh, I mean, I'll, 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 I'm just going to piggyback, which is everyone's favorite term. That actually in my class in in school, we said that so much that we actually had to vow never to say it again because everyone's starting to (laughs) yes and each other and they're like, you're not saying that. Anyway, but to to go off of uh, what Aaron was saying, yeah, I mean, we met at my first convention. Um, uh, Bowie Kim uh, connected us, who's one of our great writers on Discovery. And she's like, I think you guys would click. And she was very right. (laughs) (laughs) Very right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But, Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, real quick, just speaking of that very first convention, I think it was maybe three years ago that you were at, Mary. Mm -hmm. Um, I do remember seeing you. You were the person, the new Star Trek Discovery person that was brave enough to walk into the vendor's room and just stand (laughs) there and say, here I am, guys. I'm sailing. <laughs> and I was like, that's a brave lady. That's not going to last long. <laughs> Most people, they just got to go and hide off into their corners. Mm-hmm. Away. But you were like, you know what? I'm going to embrace this thing. I don't mind being, you know, the, the face for now, you know, like walking mm-hmm. in, just saying, hey, you want to know what the new show's about? You want to meet somebody? Here I am. I'm happy mm-hmm. to meet you. You're, it, it was brave. Um, it was very open. And you seem very friendly. You seem very, uh, you know, supportive of the fandom and very eager mm-hmm. to, you know, give that love back. Uh, was that the thought process behind it or were you just <laughs> lost? No, no, that, that definitely was. Yeah. And it, yeah, <laughs> the, that first Vegas convention before the show had even aired, it was, it was a, a wild surreal time that whole year because we started rehearsals that January in Toronto. And then because of scheduling, we were starting to promote the show while still filming. Uh, we you know we had the premiere and we were still filming the last two episodes um of the show so that was vegas that was august so again still in the thick of it and it worked out that i wasn't filming for that full week and a half so i um even requested we were only supposed to be there for that wednesday it was me and ken mitchell and wilson cruz and uh san bartholomeo so we were the four reps that could make it to vegas to just be Mm, like it's gonna be great guys um (laughs) And I think certainly on the Klingon side of things, because I had done all this research and knew that, you know, people weren't sure how we were going to really tell their story, I really wanted to be able to be an advocate um, for, you know, what I was doing, at least as the actor. You have so little control as the actor, but I wanted to make it clear to the fans that I really cared about um, 
about the storytelling, about the Klingons and representing them well. So that was definitely, I mean, um, and not in just like, haha, I did my work, as in like, I get why you're passionate. I am one of you. I am someone who cares deeply about the stories that they tell and always had that, you know, dream that the the actors and creators involved with the franchises and shows I loved cared about it as much as I did. So being provided with that opportunity uh, was was so humbling and exciting. So, yeah, I mean, we had that first panel in the giant, the giant hall. Um, and from that point on, I think, yeah, that right, pretty much, you know, moments after we'd finished that panel, we went, yeah, into the, into the vendor's room and just, you know, soaked it in. And then for those next five days, I knew that I wouldn't have that level of experience of being able to walk around as much as I did um, ever again. And even then I was still, I had to have a handler with me just because people, once right. the panel had happened, they started to be like, Oh, right. That's the Klingon lady. And like, <laughs> 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 um, so I, yeah, I'm just so grateful that I really was able to have that full experience, um, those five days and, uh, and, you know, Vegas has become such a, a staple of the year. Um, the, the subsequent, two years were you know each year had a different reverberation but I'll always remember that that first moment of really getting to meet so many fans and I you know they threw me and I helped judge the costume contest and like because I was around they're like oh yeah do that thing and I was like great <laughs> um but I'm a very uh, yes and type person and so it really was it was wonderful and totally you know I I just I the conventions are um one of if not the most um my most favorite part of being a part of uh the franchise now because it's about connecting with people who really love the stories and the characters and and celebrating them mm. yeah definitely my yeah favorite. i feel i, think the, I feel too. the same way yeah i feel yeah. the same way and and that's one of the things when i first met you mary i was thinking these are the new guys on this the new star trek and <laughs> And, they're, you know, you guys were kind of looking around like, okay, so what do we do next? And, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's still new. And I remember my feelings when I was still new in there and looking over at the, you know, Shatner's and Patrick mm -hmm. Stewart's of, of the business. So I knew that you're going to be in this convention world for a whole long time, <laughs> right? It's like this yeah. is the beginning of a long journey. And that's the beautiful thing about Star Trek is that you know, it's the beginning. It's always the beginning of a journey. Once you once you embrace the family and the fandom, it's 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 like start, opens the door for like a whole world mm -hmm. of friendships and and experiences and traveling and you know conversations and um, that's that's the beauty of I think to me is of the fandom. It's just so much there to offer for for almost any kind of a person. Well, yeah. And, yeah, and I think too, just when you were talking about that, it reminded me, you know, because I met Mary through the conventions. I met Mohammed through conventions. <laughs> and yep. then Mary was like, hey, Aaron, we're both in LA. Do you want to go see my friend Elisa's like Star Trek improv show? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I met Elisa through Mary. Mm -hmm. And yeah. even just being at the improv show, I mean, because Elisa, you've met like tons of fans, you know, yeah. through that. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they have such a strong community um, that comes every week and watches on YouTube. Um, and and that is, that's, uh, I mean, Aliza um, approached me. Our first intro was at the season one premiere. Um, and uh, we, you you inter interviewed me on the, the carpet and then came, um, approached me at the after party. Um, and as I like to say, Aliza is this luminous, gorgeous, clearly intelligent woman and she came up to me and said I'm a, you know we talked and da 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 and gave me her info and I I, just, I could just sense the the deep wonderful moral <laughs> human being that she was um and I was like yes and then you know eventually we did we got coffee and then she invited me to see TIG and uh and as a consequence I've gotten to know the impro studio in general ripley improv this amazing all-female group she's a part of and like so much of my life now is a consequence of the yes and of the star trek world um so i'm just yeah so so moved by that yeah and aaron and i've had many a wonderful evening where we've gone to see one of the shows um, yeah. um there these two yeah. are like 
are some like our favorite fans and also like, <laughs> your laughs are so distinctive in the audience it feels really good to like make you laugh because we can hear you yeah. <laughs> like, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah i yeah. yeah just echoing everything that you both just said um i yeah i've met so many wonderful people through star trek and through pursuing my own fandom and marrying my fandom with my um, my life as an improviser and as an actor and as, and as a writer. Um, Sirak, I actually met you. Um, I don't know if you remember me. I remember you. You, you remember me? <laughs> I remember you. you remember I remember you. I don't remember where we met, but I, I could never forget a beautiful face like yours. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> well, I can tell you where we met because I remember. Um, I was at STLV like 2018, maybe. And mm -hmm. I was dressed as Guinan in a yellow outfit. With the oh, hair. yes, yes. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I came over to your table and I was like, hi. <laughs> and I was literally about to say, I know you cosplay. I, I know you yeah. do the cosplay yeah. thing. Oh, yeah, you were dressed as Guinan and you were like looking radiant and just like on point oh, with your you. outfit. I loved mm -hmm. it. Yeah, Thank I remember you. now. I do remember. I think Absolutely. that was also. I don't remember if that was. I think that might have been the same day that I was like, I was like very overwhelmed because um, Nichelle Nichols was like right over there, uh -huh. and I like <laughs> did a loop first because I was like, I can't talk to her yet. I'm too nervous. And then I found you, and I was like, Oh hi, I can talk to him. Sirach's <laughs> yeah, okay. You can yeah. handle Sirach. <laughs> That was the warm up, you know. <laughs> you you right. seemed like, you know, like you yeah. were just chilling, just sitting. And, yeah. you know, Nichelle Nichols, just like legendary status. Yeah. You're a legend too, in your own right. Well, not yet. You know, it takes, it takes a while. <laughs> yeah, it takes maturity and time. There's a 25 year limit on legendary status. <laughs> there you go. There you go. They still got more time. There yeah. you go. We grow into our legacies, yes. But you know, one thing I want to highlight, though, is one thing I see in, in you and, and Mary and, and Aaron is really strong, independent women that are about their business and successful. And I think that's one thing that Star Trek allows for is, is for, you know, female empowerment and for you to go out there and do what you have to do and seize the moment. And the opportunities are there. Mm -hmm. Um especially within this culture because it's so it's it's so intellectual and it's it's not the culture of you know holding on to these old past traditions and 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 you know uh, male chauvinism and, and the patriarchy of, of society that we live under and I think that's one thing that I really um, admire about all of you is that you know you you seized the day and, and went out and just became who you wanted to become and I think that's just an awesome thing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like I will say um, there is something baked into Star Trek. I think because it uh, at its core, you know, has that optimism of, of like there being equality uh, for everyone. When you watch that, when you like just soak that in, that's going to inform a lot of how you operate in the yeah. world. Even if you're not like consciously, uh, realize that that's what's happening. And even if you're surrounded by a society, which, you know, we all are, a society where that's not the case. Um, I think I think as Star Trek fans, we, we like want better and expect better from society because we love Star Trek. Cause we're like, mm. look, we could be like that. Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Don't you want to be like that, you guys? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah. you do want this. transporters? Let's do this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. We did want to talk about, and we keep touching on it, uh, Elisa, but tell us a little bit more about your improv uh, work that you do, because you and Muhammad do something uh, where you are working with Star Trek just through your own fandom and through, you know, what you already wanted to create on your own, you know, your own content. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So um, I already mentioned The Improvised Generation, which we do as a standalone stage mm -hmm. show. Um, we're very tiny, but we're mighty, and we mm -hmm. have a wonderful uh, community of fans, uh, Star Trek fans, and also now The Improvised Generation fans, which is incredible and wonderful. Um, and so since then, I've also evolved into doing uh, tabletop RPG content. 
And so at first, I, I used to work for Nerdist, which is uh, why I was on the red carpet um, interviewing Mary a few years ago. Uh, and I also worked for Geek and Sundry, which is their sister company, oh, uh, cool. doing gaming. Uh, I was basically like a gaming host and uh, played uh, RPG characters in long term campaigns. So the first one that I did was called Shield of Tomorrow. And that was a Starfleet crew playing a Star Trek Adventures game. Um, and we did that for a year. And uh, so that was like, a, you know, we, we were using the Modifius system, which is a Star Trek licensee uh, for the Star Trek Adventures system, creating Star Trek content that's not canon. And it's kind of in this weird in-between place because it's not, it, it's sort of, uh, it's still professional level production but it's, um, it's not like Star Trek official content. Um, so I've been in this like kind of, kind of fun gray area for a while now. Um, mm. And now, you know, we've, uh, we've like graduated from Geek and Sundry and our group is now creating, uh, there's another campaign called Clear Skies that's currently running. And that's a Starfleet crew playing Star Trek Adventures. And now uh, next Monday, we're at, or I guess when this airs, it will have already premiered. <laughs> but um, we will have premiered Blood of the Void, which is an all Klingon version of uh, the oh. Star Trek Adventures game. So yeah, we're, and also we, we wanted, so me and the game master, Eric Campbell, who is the game master for Clear Skies and for Shield of Tomorrow, we, when we were creating the Klingon show and deciding what direction to go in, we had two objectives. One was we wanted it to be a diverse table. Um, we wanted it actually to be like all people of color. And number two, we also wanted to like show the diversity of Klingons. Um, mm. And because they're so like Klingons are so fleshed out that really the only direction to go in is like, well, what about the weird Klingons that you don't know about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Klingons who were raised as like my my character was actually uh, from the farming cast and then decided to like buck the trends of staying on the farm her whole life and become a commander of a KDF ship. Uh, and we Ooh. have other characters who grew up like hunting, so like in the woods. Um, we have characters who are like political strategists and who aren't like, we're not, uh, we're not just warriors. We, we are bringing like the other layers of, of personhood to, to Klingon characters. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's, that's Blood of the Void. Um, and again, we're working with licensees and it feels good to get to share in like creating Star Trek stories while also just watching the Star Trek stories and mm -hmm. and getting to like you know play Star Trek online and see the new by the way the new Klingon I don't know if any of you are into that but like the new Klingon stories in Star Trek online are dope and amazing mm -hmm. and we hope to like incorporate those into our stories if possible so mm -hmm. it's yeah it's really nice to be in this place of um a fan creating professional content but like kind of adjacent to the official mm -hmm. canon Star Trek Online's doing amazing things. I mean, I don't play oh. it, but they're everything that they're talking about. Every, everybody can yeah. just const, everybody's constantly talking about all the great stuff that's going in it. There's a great tribute to uh, Aaron Eisenberg in there, Nog, and yes. uh, we're always hearing great things about it. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm Muhammad. actually going to start streaming it soon on my Twitch. I'm super, no way super nice. excited. Yeah. Uh oh, uh, somebody's Twitch. Include that, we'll include that <laughs> link in the, uh, in the description box. Oh, yes, yeah, I will. Yeah. Nice. So, Mohammed, tell us about uh, the coolest book ever written, by the way. <laughs> I wouldn't be lying. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, the Bible? So the book was, yeah, right? <laughs> yes, the coolest book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, my book is actually an outcome of talks I've been giving at conventions. So, like Dr. Aaron, I've been giving talks at conventions for a couple of years on... Uh, science basically trying to teach science concepts but using star trek or other sorts of science fiction to try to engage people in it so you know one big talk i give fairly regularly is on basically evidence for evolution or on various genetics topics things like that i've been doing that at conventions for a while um, a publisher uh princeton university press reached out to me and asked me if i'd be interested in writing some sort of outreach book and i said i have an idea it's a little bit non-standard <laughs> this is an <laughs> academic press so they're used to like you know textbooky kind of things so some outreach mm -hmm. books too I, I ran this by them and they're like, yeah, let's give it a shot. And it was really, really fun putting it together and just, you know, going through, like I said, that year of watching all the episodes, and <laughs> trying to extract things. From it. But importantly, it's not trying to explain Star Trek. It really is 
a science outreach book. So it actually mirrors in coverage exactly what I cover in my introductory biology classes at Duke, but just pulls examples from Star Trek and say, here's how this was depicted once. Let's talk about the real science and let's see how good this actually is depicted in the episode. So basically it's just using it to create a narrative. So after making the book, then I actually taught a class at Duke called Genetics Evolution Star Trek. <laughs> so cool. It was really, yeah. <laughs> really fun. I was nervous because like a bunch of college kids, I'm not sure how many of them have even seen any Star Trek. And most of them had not seen anything beyond, say, the reboot movies. And this was right around mm. the time Discovery had just come out. So there hadn't been an mm -hmm. opportunity yet for that. Um, so they were they were totally into it. I mean, they, they really engaged. So we'd watch parts of episodes or sometimes even whole episodes. And then I'd say, all right. Let's talk about the science and we'd really break it down and, and talk about like how this really works and they got the same topics that, that we teach in the introductory class so that's mm -hmm. been really fun doing that and recently yeah. i just spun that off uh, little pieces from it into a youtube series called bio trekkie explains kind of copying dr aaron too she has a lot of really cool video content too so <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> copy <She> does <laughs> and we're going to include both of those in the description box below as well uh and the two of you um, with what you're doing is you're basically at this point inspiring, you know, young minds to go into science and to like Star Trek, which is cool. Uh, kind of like when you were younger and you were inspired to go into science and go in, uh, to Star Trek. Do you feel uh, Muhammad and Aaron after that, uh, that there's ever a moment where you can see you're, you're making somebody change their mind or you can I know Muhammad, you're, you're teaching in front of students at Duke. Do you ever see that aha moment where something clicks? And Definitely. that's just gotta be the best feeling. It's amazing, it's amazing. Yeah. Something, yeah. Uh, oh, no, I'll let Aaron well, speak first. I was first. just gonna say, yeah, like what's, what's really fun is doing, for me, because I don't teach in a classroom anymore, and that was the hardest part for me about leaving academia was I love teaching. What I have you that teaching? I was just, I mean, I taught, because I was a researcher, but as part of my duties as an employee of the university, I had to teach classes, and the Astronomy 101 and Physics 101 are always the hot potatoes that no one wants to touch, um, because they're hard to teach, and a lot of people have been immersed, you know, the PhDs and the professors have been immersed in their field for so long that it's so hard to step back without using like massive difficult differential calculus to explain, you know, how <laughs> Let's go around the sun and um but i i really like that you know without being too humble i'm really good at the introductory stuff and that i can see because i wasn't naturally good at math i feel mm. like i can teach it without mm. requiring that you know that's not my only way of communicating and the best way for me to teach these difficult topics is to tie it to science fiction because that is a reference point that a lot of these students get and particularly with astronomy you know we we can't really do this stuff in a lab and you can say like look up and <laughs> stars doing that but it's really because we're rotating and like the sun sets but we're moving and and like a lot of it is conceptually difficult but if you're able to just be like all right you see this star trek episode it's like that <laughs> people start to get that and and that is really really exciting it's fun. dr aaron also has an yeah. audio book that's fantastic called the science yes. of science fiction Thank it's on you. audible yeah I, the science the of science fiction Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Um, and it's just, it's a really, a, like, kind of like Muhammad's book. This one is, it's an audio only, it's Audible original, but it's kind of all my talks, mostly on, like, gravity, space time, and all of that stuff, how we see that in science fiction, just with a ton of examples in there. Um, but what's been so nice, too, though, and I think um, Mary might have been going down this road, but... <laughs> Uh, the support from, from Star Trek of seeing how much people do love the science. And in fact, right. one of the first talks that Muhammad and I gave together at Dragon Con, the Discovery cast oh, yeah. crashed in secret. <laughs> they sat in the back. My partner smuggled them all in because they legitimately wanted to learn and wanted to watch the talk. And then Ken Mitchell gave them all up at the very end. <laughs> wow. It was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Did that any of them so raise fun. their hand and say, are spore drives a thing? Is that even <laughs> yeah. possible? Yeah, right. Ken, Ken yeah. raised his hand and I was like, well, yeah. this is it. And so we yeah. called on him and he asked Muhammad a biology question about dehydration under oh pressure. <laughs> 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 it, was, it was so good because everyone, like being in from the back, you just saw everyone's head go, Voom. like, <laughs> they were like, oh my God. And yeah, it was me and Ken and Jane. Um, it was, it, it, it was, it was, that was a great moment. And yeah, that definitely was the, the, the rabbit hole I was starting to go down, but I, I really just wanted to shout out, um, 
both Muhammad and Aaron for their talks. And um, my yeah, when I first met Aaron at um, uh, uh, what, uh, Starfest, Denver. Starfest. I know there's so many. It's like star stuff. <laughs> Lots of star stuff convention. Yeah. Um, and just I was able to come to some of her talk, like with scheduling and stuff. Often we're always like strangers in the night because I'm oh I'm going to this panel. You're doing your talk. Um, but I did get to see part of it, and I really love. I mean, like uh, as my, like Aaron is one of my best friends, but also now, I mean, at the time I was just meeting her for the first time and just the personality that she brings to the talks and um, having all of her badass geeky tattoos and just being so passionate and as a very deeply enthusiastic, passionate person. Uh, I was definitely sitting there going like, oh, yep, this is going to work out. This is going to be. <laughs> um, but I think that's so important. I think enthusiasm is something that is often made fun of or put down because people are afraid to fully express themselves. And something I appreciate, appreciate about the core Trek community, whether it be on Twitter or in person at these conventions, is a celebration of enthusiasm. And, you know, of course, you know, there's always some, some naysayers, but for the most part, the majority is so about that positivity and that uplifting of each other and celebrating that we all have our own fandom, that we all love it for different reasons and in different ways, and that's so fine. Yeah. Um, but tying into just watching Aaron that first time and henceforth is seeing, you know, the other women in the room who also have a cool geeky tattoo and like got the cool red hair, what, whatever it is. And I know for you, you talk about with both Janeway and Scully, like that, you know, it's, it's, I, I will never stop talking about how representation is so important. Um, and I'm so thrilled too. I, I haven't even said this to you at Aliza that it, it that your Klingon or TGRPG, there we go. I said it, um, <laughs> is so, um, diversified or this new term that I'm really coming to love and embrace normalized because that's mm -hmm. really, that's what it is. It is not a, it is, it, that is the world. Um, and I think it's so important that those voices are seen and heard and that the representation behind the scenes is happening as much as it is on screen. Cause that like I mean it's a testament when with fan created content it's coming directly from the fan who has their own experience who loves the show as it has been told but has their own unique perspective and yeah. that's what I love seeing with the science um the fact that you get to consult um it, the science in the show it's like coming from people that actually care about the show and it creates a great yes and environment where you're like, I want the show to be great. I don't want to just tell you that you didn't get the science perfectly. I want to be like, okay, great. That's a really cool idea. How do we make that work thematically and scientifically? Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah. I, I just really celebrate that and, and love that and love that I've been able to have a window into that. As a, you know, as a fan, I get to see more of the cogs and wheels than I normally would. So yeah. Great. And yeah, I'm not sure we talk enough about... Um, Star Trek and diversity and inclusion and normalization. And so like, you know, we have Ciroc and we have, you know, our few black Trek actors that we like hold on to. And back then, especially because there were so few, there was so, there was so little representation everywhere else. Uh, and Star Trek also provided a place where people of color could come and see themselves reflected in the future. Um, and, and that is, that's huge. That's so huge. Um, the reason I got so hooked on Guinan was because when I was doing my re my like rewatch or a lot of it was first watch, but like rewatch <laughs> of TNG and TOS and then watching all the other series. Um, I got hooked on Guinan because I, I realized like, yeah, I've got to see this woman as a kid, like Whoopi Goldberg stepped up and said, I wanna be on this show. I wanna, I wanna be a part of history. And she created a space for herself. And that's literally like what I've had to do to feel empowered in my own career. And so the, the blueprint is there. I think for everyone, everyone can find some type of like empowerment by like uh, dig, diving into why you like Star Trek. Even just asking yourself that question can like help you hone in on how to empower yourself in your life. That's so powerful, so mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it is, absolutely. And imagery is so important for the future generations. They need to be able to see themselves uh, on on screen and see themselves, you know, projected in a positive way. 
Um, mm-hmm. That's one of the things that really plagues the black community is there's a lot of negative imagery in our community with the music and, 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 the, and the videos and movies. And they always portray us in these kind of stereotypical boxes. And it's important for people out there to say, oh, well, there's other options out there for me. I can be an intelligent person. I can be an articulate person. Um, I can carry myself with grace. I don't have to be, you know, showing my body or, or doing things in the way that are derogatory or negative. You know, I can represent a positive image. And, and even though the characters are flawed, they still are doing their overall trying to do the best. They're trying to mm-hmm. make it work. They're trying to figure out their differences. They're trying to work together as a team. And, you know, those are the important themes that, that Star Trek leaves us all with. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, on our show, Sirak and I do talk about that theme a lot where, you know, 28 years ago, seeing an African-American father and an African-American son and how they were such a model of good parenting, you know, uh, it's really important uh, back then. I do think it's cool, Aliza, that you mentioned basically that, uh, Whoopi Goldberg and Guinan uh, did to you or for you what Nichelle did for her, uh, mm. you know, however many years ago that was. Um, so hopefully 20 or 30 years from now, somebody will be saying, and then I saw Aliza Pearl and I knew. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, exactly. I can only hope. I can only hope yeah. to have that kind of impact. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and uh, Sirac, going back to what you said about um, just – having other options, seeing other options. Um, another thing that I think, so I, I was like, you know, 80s to 90s kid. And so in the 90s, we had this like beautiful array of black shows on the WB. And I didn't realize at the time how special that was because then it went away. And we had mm-hmm. another like decade and a half where there wasn't very much representation for black people on TV, like main primetime TV or uh, mm-hmm. mainstream TV, I should say. Um, and so, so it's, yeah, it's, it's about quantity. It's also about quality, but it's also about like diversity within. Um, so for instance, within black representation, we are not a monolith. There's so much, there's so much diversity within mm-hmm. blackness. And like my family is very, is probably like culturally different from Ciroc's. And, you know, we all, we have so many different, like, but also a lot of similarities. Like, so, so I am just super excited to, I want to contribute to that and just like keep showing black people and, and all forms, you know, all forms of life in different iterations in genre, because for Mm -hmm. me, genre and sci-fi and fantasy are the, the ways that people can imagine and kind of access a better future and different mm-hmm. options and different ideas. Yeah, Avery used to call it the wonder of possibilities. And mm-hmm. that's, that's what we get I can get hear that in his voice. Ooh, yeah, 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 me right? Too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the beauty of it. It's the, the possibilities, the wonder of it. And, and we can play with it and make it what we want and tailor make it. And um, I think it's important as, as, as the legacy of Star Trek continues and there are going to be more shows and there will be plenty of more series to come that they stay true to those things that help motivate all of us to want to be better, to want to achieve or to want to, in, you know, get into the sciences or learn about acting as a craft or, or learn about making stage plays and, and mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is, there's so many um, offshoots that um, just allow for us to grow yeah. as a community. Well, yeah, the in, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. The work is right. never done. That's, I mean, that's the, the tragic beauty of it. And not tragic, it's, it's um, the, um, uh, well, empowering really and, and motivating um, is that we, we are always striving for more. And that's something I've really come to appreciate about, yeah, the franchise as a whole is that we do have these ideals um, and Aaron and I talked about this the other week um, with the re- uh, redemption episodes um, about how with Klingons and I'm sure Elisa in your rewatching and research that we're striving for honor, we're striving <laughs> for things, but we're not attaining it fully either. You know, that right. the politics are convoluted and obviously mm-hmm. Klingon empire is 
you know, quite far away from where the Federation is and the Federation still struggles. But I think that even though it is more of a utopian future, there is still striving for mm -hmm. greater understanding. Um, and yeah, it's a, I, maybe it's the, the, the humbling, humbling aspect of it is that there will always be more room for more compassion and understanding um, and just listening, which I think is a huge um, topic being talked about right now, is that just the ability to listen and learn um, and, and ask questions when appropriate. Like, I, I just feel that that is so what Trek is about. And so that's something that people really can and should be looking to now as we continue to try and move towards that future. <laughs> Yeah. So friends, we just have a, a couple minutes left um, here, but I did want to uh, throw out one more question that I think would be really fun to dive into. Um, maybe it's a two-part question. I would be like the guys at the Star Trek convention that say, I have a seven-part <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then you're For like, sale. oh, great. Uh, uh, it's going to be a long one. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. My little nerd heart beats strongly in here. Um, I love it. Number one is what above all has Star Trek inspired in you? Like whatever it's be kind to people or whether it's to go into education. Um, and the other part is considering your work within Star Trek and what you do and everything that is influenced by Star Trek, what do you hope to inspire in others? We're going to start with Muhammad Noor because he's already thought about this a thousand times. <laughs> so be like, I hope I'm not first. Oh, shit. <laughs> All right, I'll start with Sirach then. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that was funny because, Muhammad, I was thinking of how your students feel when you call on them. <laughs> now yeah, you know what it's you. like. Now I feel it. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, you know, for me, it's, it's about the family. And that's what uh, I've been inspired by. You know, it's just the family. And for me, coming up during that particular time in my life, my family was splitting. My parents were divorcing. And I needed that um, father figure. And Avery really stepped in at the exact right moment mm -hmm. and picked up exactly where I needed him to be as far as guidance and, you know, um, helping me go through my maturation process. So um, that's what I get out of it is family. And that's what I hope people will be inspired by is to have respect for family, to love your family, to get to know your family. And I look at it like the whole community is a family. It's, it's not just me and the Cisco's, you know, I look at it like it's the whole collection of us that, have this same common interest and that's the family and we can we can talk things out we can debate things we can you know argue our points of view but at the end of the day you still love that person and you still you know honor the fact that you guys are family and that, that that's what's important for me nice great answer <laughs> muhammad did we buy you enough time yeah, sure. <laughs> all right. I was trying to think of I was trying to think of an overarching answer, and I mean, all the things that you guys were talking about just recently in the context of diversity and representation, those are huge. I was trying to think of something that catches that and other aspects. And I think a big part of what I really love about Star Trek is forcing you to think about things that you take for granted in a fundamentally different way. And it feels like that's what a lot of the writing in Star Trek is. It's something that you might be familiar with, but it's twisted. It's twisted in this different sort of way that you're not used to thinking about it, and it forces you to reconsider like your assumptions. And I mean, that I've actually found very, very intellectually stimulating as I'm watching Star Trek. So I was like, wow, I've never, I've never thought about this problem in this particular way because it's, it's, it's turning things on their head a little bit sometimes. And sometimes it's in the context of politics, sometimes in the context of sociology, sometimes in the context of science. But I love that. I think that's just fantastic. And I, I don't think you know, anything I produce will exactly do that. But I'm hope, my hope is that some of the content that I produce will help people as they try to think about it, things in a different mm -hmm. way as it's presented in Star Trek. They'll then understand it a little better. Like, okay, if it's not this and it's this way, let me, let me change my framework to fit that. And specifically in the context for me, in the context of the science. But I'm hoping they'll take that in all the areas, particularly in the context of uh, diversity and inclusivity and things like mm -hmm. that too. God, I wish you were my teacher when I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're very kind. Uh, Elisa, what about you? 
Uh, first, what was the second part of the question? Because I forgot that. First part is what, uh, above all, has Star Trek inspired in you? And uh, the second part is what do you hope to inspire in others in your ah. Star Trek related work? Okay. I think well, that's what I, it's yeah. close yeah. to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> that's what I heard. Couldn't remember the second Thank half. Thank goodness. Then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, for me, um, yeah, I think, you know, the Guinan story for me, um, creating my own space and taking up space and that I love space. Ha ha ha. Fun there. <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, like it really did. Um, uh, Star Trek gave me permission to fully be myself. And I don't mm -hmm. think anything else uh, could have done that in that same way. Um, and what I hope what I hope others are inspired by my contributions to Star Trek. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, wow. Wow. That's hard to answer. I guess I, yeah, I guess I, I want, I want people to have more empathy and to, um, I want us to like open our minds more to different possibilities of being and, um, if I can infuse that into my work and into my fandom and into my own things that I create, then that would be great. Awesome. Nice. Uh, Mary, uh, before we ask you, I mm -hmm. did want to point out that you're the first person we've ever spoken to that's used the term henceforth, by the way. So <laughs> congratulations to that. Yes. That was pretty cool. <laughs> don't think Mary. you got away with it without us noticing that you said henceforth. Academic at heart. <laughs> yes, this will be my legacy. <laughs> uh, oh, that brings me such joy. Uh, <laughs> and I feel like very Klingon of me. That would, I, yeah. I, I love would be, and henceforth. But I almost, <laughs> that is like the mother's speech. But no, from this point forth, this point forth. That's how I said it. But close. Um, I, I will, I hope, I want to make a little badge for myself. I said henceforth <laughs> at the virtual chat con. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I'm glad uh, that, that, that got me in a, a laughing because I, I am very, very moved by everyone's answers. Um, mm. And so, oh, here we go. Um, I feel that, yeah, what, what speaking specifically and now being involved directly in, in the storytelling, I think what that has inspired in me, I did, you know, growing up realize, oh, I need to be the role model I want to see. Um, you know, that while I could graft characters I was seeing, uh, to fit certain, you know, I have my Ripley, I have my, you know, whatever it was. Um, but I realized, oh, no one is quite like me. And I want to be able to put that full self out there. Um, you know, and I think this is in line with pretty much what everyone's been saying is that if I can be the fullest version of myself, hopefully that can inspire others to do the same. And it's not about them trying to replicate what I'm doing. It's about being like, great, that person is standing in her own power. Um, I, I want to do the same. So that's actually kind of more of the second half of that question. But I think being a part of the show and because Laurel is such a strong and flawed character, I mean, to be able to, to give empathy to um, a, a female character who is trying to learn. Like I, I like to view her as, as a very strong example of the type of person we need in the world who is someone who has a very strong belief based off of their own experiences, but is through her own experiences we see on the show, grows and changes and listens and learns. And um, as a consequence becomes a true leader because she's willing to see both sides. Um, even if she doesn't completely agree with how the Federation conducts itself or whatnot. And she's having to shed an entire lifetime of um, propaganda and presumptions about who the Federation is in order to have diplomatic relations with them. So yeah, I think I just synthesized your two questions together, but just to be able to represent um, a character who has that level uh, of of nuance has inspired me to henceforth, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, do that in other work. Uh, yeah, put it back in there. But you know, this has been an incredible experience to do it. Like I said, this is my—I mean, I don't know if I said this out right, but you know, my first 
big job being out of school and I learned so much about what happens on set behind the scenes. Um, I've learned how I want to be a better creator and tell the stories I want to tell. Um, and I hope in 10 years time, I'm talking about the production company that I've created that is nice. able to give voice to others, um, both similar and very different from mine. Um, I had a friend ask me that recently, like where you see yourself. And I was like, that's really what I keep seeing is like, yes, I love acting. And yes, I want to keep creating my own content, but to be able to bring people together and give voice um, to people who have in the past been marginalized or minoritized for whatever reason. Um, so it's really inspired me to just be a part of that movement, full throttle and vocalize and be active um, within the Trek community and elsewhere. So, yeah. you know, when you uh, create this company that takes over the world in a wonderful yeah. way <laughs> uh, and they say, they say, so are you the CEO? Are you going to say, no, I'm the mother. Or are you going to say, <laughs> no, I'm the chief. Wait, those are your two Oh my God. Wow. I think I'm the chief mother. I'm the yeah, chief yeah. mother, mother chancellor. <laughs> chancellor. I throw them all in there. I'm the chief mother chancellor. Yeah. I think, yeah, I'll just have a really, it'll be like uh, uh, Emperor Giorgio's title. I just keep right. going. Yes. I'm the chief mother chancellor, CEO, runner of dancing and other things. I will, yeah. Use letters, CMC, chief mother chancellor. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> Look at that. Uh -oh. CMC Music Factory. Nice. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, Aaron, uh, before we get to you, there was one specific thing also that you said that made me perk up was that you said Scotland like a Scottish person. You were like, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And I went to Scotland. <laughs> and you went right back into it. Uh, I don't know if that was on purpose or what. <laughs> no, it sneaks out occasionally. I lived in Glasgow for like, in there, again, Glasgow mm -hmm. for uh, <laughs> almost four years and the UK in total for five. And um, Glasgow is probably the most, I mean, I, I love, I love Glasgow. My soul is in Glasgow. I have met, like my mom gets confused when she goes to Glasgow because she just sees copies of me walking around everywhere. Scottish <laughs> 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 at heart. Um, and uh, but the diet it's not a it's not a it's not English it's not another language it's just a, the most crazy dialect and um, so my brain translates when I'm in that mode and if I'm with other Glaswegians and if especially if there is uh, drinking involved the Glasgow it it'll be every I'll be like yeah all right all right I'll get a nice <laughs> <laughs> so, really but again kind of like what Mary said I'm glad that you made me laugh because I was starting to get emotional thinking about my answer to this um because I think for me my journey with Star Trek has kind of been in two parts at this stage is that as a fan and coming up in a career in the sciences I had Captain Janeway and what Janeway taught me was how to be a leader and, you know, kind of a little, a little bit how Lisa talked about, you know, Guinan and Whoopi Goldberg, particularly carving out her own space. What I got for me personally from Janeway was how to take charge and how to command a room and how to be confident in your decisions and take responsibility for the decisions you make. And I, I don't know why that character in particular spoke to me so much. But it really did. And and I carried her through. I'm like a one woman career panel for an astrophysics degree. I've done everything you can do with an astrophysics degree. Um, <laughs> but as like, you know, I was a senior engineer leading a team and there was lots of, and there was a lot of time. There were a lot of people older than me. It was not a diverse crowd at all. <laughs> um, you know, I was the most unrepresented person there and um, or underrepresented person there. And it was, it was hard. It was really, really tough. And when my parents finally, once I got a job with Star Trek, they finally watched an episode of Star Trek. And so I made them, I made them watch Voyager. And my mom called me immediately afterwards. She was like, I think I get you now. Like, I, <laughs> because of how much I've shaped my career and my, my interactions with people based on this character. But mm. Then moving into the professional space of Star Trek, I think what it's given me, and this is what I started to get really emotional about, is the family, you know, that, and Sarek said that too, that we're all, it, I know all of these people here because of Star Trek, but we all are genuinely friends and you build this, this community and it's like, 
whether in the professional setting or in the professional fan setting at, you know, the conventions or the amazing stuff that Eliza does, um, you're, we're all Star Trek fans and that brings us all together. And it's such a unique beast, but at the same time, when you meet other Star Trek fans, you do have that bond. And even if it's like mine is Janeway, someone else's might be, you know, Kira and Nerace or something, mm -hmm. we still have our characters and we understand what that means to us. Um, and I think that that's so important. And what I hope my contributions to Star Trek, other than some awesome techno babble that I can work <laughs> in, just, um, I just, I hope, I think especially at the fan facing side of the work that I do, being in front of fans and teaching science through Star Trek, I just hope that I can pass on the, the license to be authentically yourself. Because I think that's what I've struggled with so much in my life, was feeling like I had to, okay, well, I'm getting a PhD in astrophysics, so I'm going to be a professor. And that little voice was like, but I don't want to be a professor. <laughs> so know, bad. And getting all the jobs and figuring out what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Mohammed, you were a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and all these jobs, I just, I never found where my soul and where my heart was. And I just, and I ended up having to take so many risks to continue to just, because I wasn't giving up on, I knew there would be something out there for me. Mm -hmm. And, and then finding that and then Star Trek, you know, like Mary, it's kind of our first big jobs in this industry, giving that, having that be our first break. is like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. but you know, but I have found my love and I have found my passion. And so even though it's a little bit later and there's been a lot of false starts, finding my voice through writing and finding my voice in the entertainment industry and finding my love and my passion, all I hope to, sh to pass on to people is that it's okay to have those false starts and just don't, mm. don't give up that authentic, genuine self that you are, because there is a place for you, even if you have to carve it out yourself, you just, it takes not giving up. And that's, that's what's so important. Star mm -hmm. Trek is lucky to have you and all you guys here, including Ryan too. I mean, oh, you, you even Ryan, kind of I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't even pay you anything. That's the question. That's why I said even Ryan. <laughs> 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 but it's, yeah. yeah. Thank you for asking really. that question, though. Yeah, yeah it's a great it's question. A great, yeah, and it you is. You guys bring a lot of passion beautiful. to to all of your answers, so we had a feeling that you might have some pretty good answers for that question. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, to echo Muhammad's sentiments, Star Trek is very lucky to have you guys. Uh, we're very lucky to have, you know, what Sorok and Avery brought 28 years ago, uh, led by Ira back in the day. And we're very happy that you guys are carrying the torch for us. And to however far you want to go, take it for <laughs> decades. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Henceforth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't even really know what that means. I guess it means... Well, late, you know, just, from here on out. I'm just gonna keep saying. <laughs> yes. Anytime I see you now. <laughs> yes, hence That's what fourth. I love Chief it. Chief mother. Thank you. Yes, Chief mother. Chief mother <laughs> chancellor. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> oh my gosh, right. I love it. <laughs> well, thanks very much, guys. This has been awesome, as we suspected it would be. And special thanks to Mary for coming up with this uh, panel idea. That's Very all nice. her. Thank you. Yeah, looks nice. <laughs> yes. So, so thrilled and humbled to know all of you. It's really such a gift. It's been a really gift. And, and you know what? This is the gift that Aaron Eisenberg gave us, this, mm -hmm. this platform to be able to get together and share these stories and, and just, you know, grow this friendship, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's our legend, our living legend guy that's always going to be with us in spirit. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank all of you. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you for keeping it going. Yeah. It, as we'd say in Klingon, katlo, which is thank you. Katlo. I just yeah. learned that. And I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. There you go. Great. Nice. <laughs> Well, everything that we mentioned, we will include in the description box below. So uh, everybody that's watching, if anything sounded interesting, probably all of it, just go down there and definitely, I mean, obviously check out Discovery, check out Aliza's uh, awesome improv and, and the Klingon 
stuff that I'm still not even really sure. I'm not a game guy, so I really it's, it's all so confusing <laughs> to me. But it sounds so I'll talk awesome. You through it. Yeah, I'll talk thank you. Please do. Yeah. Thank That's you. I means. need it. Yeah. And uh, Aaron and uh, Muhammad. Muhammad's got the books and his new uh, podcast. Aaron's got the videos. Both of them are. Uh, science advisors. It's just, you guys are doing so many cool things for us for the Star yeah. Trek world. Uh, we'll have all that in the description box below. And everybody yeah. at home, thank you very much. We'll see you on the next one. What, what, by the way, what should be a good closing thing that we say? Should we be like, um, Virtual so Trek Con! <laughs> <laughs>